module number seven, we've called the place of dialogue. And you'll, you'll see why that is fairly shortly. But you remember last time we looked at the question of what is the gospel? And then how do we explain it in a way that we remember what's important about it? And so we looked at the fact that there were nine gospel sermons in the book of Acts. And uh, we looked at one of those in Acts 5 in more detail. And we looked at the things that Peter mentioned in that sermon to the, the captain of the guard. And then uh, we drew that out and, and saw how we could use an outline. Uh, and the outline that I uh, introduced you to was God, man, God, what if I don't, what if I do? And that reminded us to talk about God as the ruler, human beings as rebels, God's rescue plan in Jesus through his death and resurrection and his call to repentance and faith. And then what if we don't, uh, we face judgment. What if we do, we uh, are forgiven. And we, we start a new life and a promise of never being separated from God. And I hope you've had the opportunity over this last week to practice that either with other people or with yourself so that you, you really get it off well, because you will get opportunities if you ask them for them to be able to share that. So we looked at what the apostles did in terms of what they included in their gospel presentation. But now we're going to look more today at the way they shared the gospel, because they didn't just go down the street, apprehend people and give them a God, man, God, what if I do, what if I don't a presentation. They were really wise in the way they went about communication. So we're going to learn this time from reading between the lines, between their presentations to see how the whole situation was set up under the sovereign leading of the Holy Spirit. So I want to give you, I want to show you first of all, a, a cartoon. And this is a, a cartoonist by the name of Gary Larson. Some of you might be familiar with uh, Gary Larson because uh, he's very much loved, uh, at least in the West. And uh, he loves including animals in his, his cartoon. So here's a cartoon from Gary Larson. What we say to dogs. Okay, Ginger, I've had it. You stay out of the garbage. Understand, Ginger? Stay out of the garbage or else. And then the second frame is what they hear. Blah, blah, ginger, blah, 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 ginger, blah, 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 blah. Now, if I were to say to you, you can un unmute your microphones here, but there's a problem here in communication, obviously. It's a, an attempt at cross-species communication, and it's not very successful. So what is, how would you describe this problem? Mario. We don't, we have different, um, what we can, what I can say is that we have different way of communication. Uh, we are not sa the same species, species. Yeah. yeah, so no, that's definitely true. A dog is a different species from a human. But the thing about this communication is that it's partially successful. That's what I want you to understand here partially successful because the dog does understand something doesn't he what does the dog hear uh, his name his name yeah the dog recognizes his name and you can see how alert the dog looks he's looking at the master so he he hears his name but what's what's the problem with the rest of the communication Don't understand. The dog. Yeah, he doesn't. But why doesn't he understand? What's the man doing that he doesn't understand? Using the man's language. Uh, yes, but he understands some of the language, doesn't he? He understands the word ginger. What doesn't he understand? The dog is only taught that word. The Sorry, the other words, Harold. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, they are exactly. trained only for that. Exactly. So the dog only understands the word ginger. And the problem is that the man is using words that are not in the dog's vocabulary. So the, the dog understands some English, namely his name, but the, the man is using dog words that aren't in the dog's vocabulary. So of course the dog doesn't understand. Now, do we ever do this as Christians? Do we ever use words that are not in our listeners' vocabulary? Can you give me some examples oh. of words we might use as Christians that that even people who speak our own language might not understand? Born again. Born again. Justification. 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 Yeah. Celebration. Yeah. Redemption. <laughs> Redemption. Yes, Han. Thank you. Our sins are washed in the blood of Jesus. Yeah, it, uh, certainly sins, they might have a very different understanding of what that is. And washed in the blood of Jesus, well, is that something that you would like to happen to you if you didn't understand what it meant? It's it's a beautiful truth to us Christians, but it means nothing to a non-Christian. And so there are lots of words that we Christians use and understand, but they're not in the vocabulary of other people. And so when we speak to them, we have to speak to them in words that they understand. And if there are <clears throat> difficult concepts like justification, sanctification, propitiation, sin, uh, and washed in the blood and so on, we have to be able to explain them in words that are in people's vocabulary. <clears throat> and the point I'm making to you here is that if you look at the way the apostles did evangelism, they followed three fairly simple rules. And the first one was that they used language that people understood. Now, you might think that uh, St. Paul never got into this trouble. But if we go to Acts 17, we see Paul going to Athens, the, this, the uh, capital city of Greece as we know it today. He goes into the marketplace you can, you can go to the Areopagus today, Mars Hill, and stand, stand on that. I stood there myself and looked down into the marketplace where Paul uh, spoke, where the ruins are still there. And he tried to share the gospel with him. And we read in verse 18, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be talking about foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. And so here was this great apostle who knew Christ and he's trying to explain the gospel to people and they just say, what is this babbler trying to say? Blah, 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 blah. And then we see that they take Paul off to the Areopagus, Mars Hill, and he preaches a sermon, which is printed there from verse 22 through to uh, 30, 31 of chapter 17. And if you go up into Mars Hill, you'll see the entire sermon written out uh, in on a brass plate and uh, nailed into the wall on the top of Mars Hill, just up under the um, the uh, uh, all the temples up there on the Areopagus. And uh, if you read through this sermon you'll find that Paul very cleverly explains all these concepts. Now, in his initial conversation, he used three words that people didn't understand. The first one was the Greek word euangelion, which means good news. The second was the word Jesus, Jesus. And the third was the word anastasis. Claudia's second name, anastasis. But it means resurrection. And so here were three concepts that they didn't understand. So he goes along and then he preaches a sermon without using these words in the same way, in a way that they do understand. So we need to de-jargonize uh, our gospel presentations when we're talking about Jesus. We need to think about using words that really make sense to people that they understand. The second thing that Paul did <clears throat> 
was that he preached the gospel in an environment where people felt comfortable. Now, we could go through all his sermons. I just want to draw attention to four of them. So first of all, there is uh, Acts 16, uh, which we um, we made reference to a couple of weeks ago, and this was Lydia's conversion. And we, we hear that he went down to the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer and sat down and began to the, speak to the people who were sitting there. So these were people just doing their work, having conversations on the banks of the river. This is where Paul went. He went where they felt comfortable. In uh, chapter 17, verse 17, as we've just seen, he was preaching in the Areopagus, which was where all the wise men of Athens used to gather to have discussions. You see, they felt comfortable there. In chapter 19, verse 9, he goes to the lecture hall of Tyrannus, like a university lecture theatre. And we're told he held daily discussions there. And people all throughout Asia heard the gospel as a result of that. And then finally, right at the end of the book of Acts in chapter 28, verse 30, he has people around to his own rented house. So they come to his home. And in that context, he, he talks to them. Now, in all these circumstances, we see that Paul preached in an environment where his hearers felt comfortable. Not necessarily where he felt comfortable, but where they felt comfortable. And I know for, for me as a medical student, this was a great breakthrough to recognize that I wasn't going to get my uh, non-Christian atheist friends along to church where I felt comfortable, but I had to go where they felt comfortable, to the common room, to, um, you know, on the sports field, uh, uh, homes and so on. Uh, we found if we wanted to connect with Muslims, in the medical schools, then lecture theatres were a very good neutral territory where they felt comfortable. Uh, but especially going to the mosque and being there as an invited guest was a good opportunity. Now, how often do we bring people, we bring people into our churches where they feel very, very uncomfortable. So they did it in a language they understood and an environment they felt comfortable. And then the third point here, is Paul always spoke with the opportunity for discussion. It was always a two-way conversation. And if I demonstrate this to you, if you look at, um, go back to Acts 17, and we read in Acts 17, verse 2, Paul's going to Thessalonica in modern-day Greece, and it says, as his custom was, Paul went to the, into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. So that word, that Greek word that's translated reasoned in the English Bible is the Greek word dialegami, from which we get our English word dialogue, which means two-way conversation. So he had two-way conversation with them. In verse uh, four, some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks. So this is a conversation in which they become persuaded. If we go on to verse 17, we see the same word. He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks in Athens. If we go on to verse uh, uh, 20, uh, sorry, chapter 4, verse 4, uh, in Corinth this time, every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So if you'd been there as a witness, you would have seen Paul having a conversation, two-way conversation with people. At the end of 18, we hear about Apollos, who was an early apologist, and uh, verse 28 of Acts 18, for he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So this was a debate. It was a two-way conversation going on. And in, in Acts 19, 19, 9, as we've referred to already, he took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Discussions. Now, sometimes we, we think that sharing the gospel must be done in the context of a, 
a gospel sermon uh, in a church. But when we see the apostles doing it, it's exactly the opposite. They do it in language they understand, in an environment where the hearers feel comfortable and with the opportunity for discussion. So this is the natural, godly, apostolic, uh, spirit-filled way of doing evangelism. And of course, if we look at the life of Jesus, we see uh, him doing exactly the same kind of thing. And I know for me personally, this was a huge breakthrough was to recognize that this was actually the right way to go about doing it. And, um, and to seek these opportunities for, for good conversations. And of course, the thing about a dialogue is that firstly, it enables you to check their understanding. If you're just giving a, a, a one-way talk, you don't know whether people are really understanding what you're saying. Secondly, it was an opportunity to understand their objections. Now, when a person listens to a sermon, uh, they might have all sorts of objections coming up in their mind to what's being said. But if they're not able to voice those objections, you might not know what's stopping them believing. We'll look at that in a bit more detail later. And secondly, dialogue enables them to answer their questions so that things they're raising uh, are the ones that, that um, we address. And at the end of the session, we'll, we'll have a time for, for questions as well. And I think if this raises the question, if this is the way the apostles did it, then why don't we do it? And I think if we're, uh, honest about it, it's because it's it's quite threatening and uh, almost frightening that by getting into conversation, we are putting ourselves in a situation where it is uncomfortable for us. It's a lot more comfortable to get someone to come along and uh, listen to a talk or um, encounter them on the internet or, uh, you know, even, even type things uh, into a into a, a discussion box rather than actually sitting down over a cup of coffee or over a meal uh, or after a game of sport or something and having a conversation. So there we are, there's the place of dialogue. And, and I hope, uh, I'm sure you're probably fairly convinced of this any, or anyway, but if not, I hope I've shown you that from the book of Acts and the example of the apostles, this is the natural way the apostles did it. They shared the gospel in the context of dialogue. 